information is on there, uh, not starting this Tuesday, but the, uh, the following Tuesday. So ladies, be sure to sign up for that. So over the last couple months or so, um, uh, knowing that uh, New Year's Eve was falling on a Sunday, uh, and Tony and I, we, uh, we try to kind of lay out a schedule in advance, at least about a month or so in advance, um, uh, just kind of so we know where we're headed and uh, so we can be mindful and be praying about that. But the, uh, we're looking at this particular Sunday, knowing that uh, probably be maybe a smaller crowd than we normally have and that things would be a little bit different. Not wanting to start one new series quite yet. Want to give everybody a chance to um, to uh, get settled in New Year before we do that. But but also wanting to make sure that today was a meaningful Sunday uh, for those of us that were gathering here for worship. And I've had this idea for a couple months now uh, to look at a psalm uh, on this Sunday. And at that point in time, I had no idea what that looked like. Um, but I just kind of felt like we needed to just slow down and read a psalm together. Uh, talk about that particular psalm and uh, reflect on God's goodness. And um, and so uh, we've, we've been talking about this the past couple weeks and um, still coming back to this idea, at least for me, coming back to this idea. And so um, so we're looking at Psalm 85 today. If you guys have your Bibles, uh, you can open up to Psalm 85. And Tony and I are doing something kind of different today. We're actually uh, sharing the message time uh, today. We each uh, promise we only have 12 minutes um, of material. Yeah, I know. I know. I've already done like six minutes of intro. Um, but uh, so we've got plenty of time. Uh, don't worry about that. But I just wanted to give you guys a heads up. So um, uh, I'm looking at the first half of Psalm 85. Tony is going to look at the second half. And the psalm is put, uh, really kind of interesting in even just the way it's set up. And I think it's really relevant for, for today. Uh, there's a whole lot of scripture we could look at on a day like today, you know, ending one thing and uh, walking into new life in the next year or something of that nature. But the psalm really kind of uh, sums up so much. Um, the first few verses are basically looking back. The next few verses are looking at the present. And then the second half, which Tony gets to share about, is really looking ahead. Um, so here's the thing, um, you know, just kind of thinking again uh, about Tony and I sharing. We, we definitely have different styles. You guys know that. We have different styles of sharing, but uh, we have different approaches to looking at Scripture. And I think that's one of the things that's so beneficial for me is being able to draw on other folks uh, as, we, as we look at things. So we're not looking at things one way all the time. But I did want to highlight a few verses that talk about one spirit. Um, you know, we, we have different styles, even, uh, you know, different churches have different worship styles. The music's a little bit different. The, uh, the service feels a little bit different, whatever it is. But just a few verses to remind us that there's one God. 1 Corinthians 12, 13. But we have all been baptized into one body by one spirit, and we all share the same spirit. What a powerful reminder of, of who God is, really, and what he has created his church to be. Uh, individually, collectively, all of us. We are baptized into one body by one spirit. And we share the same spirit. Ephesians 4.4, 4, for there is one body and one spirit, just as you've been called to one glorious hope for the future. That's a whole lot of ones, right? But we're talking about one thing here. One body, one spirit, one glorious hope for the future. In 1 Timothy 2.5, for there is one God and one mediator, that's Christ, who can reconcile God and humanity the man, Christ Jesus. And that's what we just got done celebrating last week, talking about Christmas, the advent, the coming of the Messiah, and we look forward to his return. Um, but how good is it that there's one God? We don't have to please a whole bunch of different gods and wonder what they all um, want. Uh, you know, they compete for interest in different ways. No, there's one God, and there's one mediator, and that is Christ Jesus. And let's keep that in mind this morning as we move forward. So, uh, again, I said we'd be looking at Psalm 85, and I uh, uh, want to just, let's just read the first half of this, and then uh, I've got a few thoughts that I want to share with you guys. So, uh, looking at verse 1, I'm reading a New Living Translation this morning, um, and uh, it'll be up on the screen behind me. Also, it's on the phone, uh, on the app, the YouVersion Bible app, you can pull it up there too. So, it says, Lord, you poured out blessings on your land. You restored the fortunes of Israel. You forgave the guilt of your people. Yes, you covered all their sins. You held back your fury and kept 
uh, back your uh, blazing anger. <clears throat> now restore us again, O God of our salvation. Put aside your anger against us once more. Will you be angry with us always? Will you prolong your wrath to all generations? Won't you revive us again so your people can rejoice in you? Show us your unfailing love, O Lord, and grant us your salvation. What a powerful prayer. So let's break this down. Let's, let's look at the first few verses here. I just want to ask this question as we're doing that. Looking back at this last year, what do you see? Looking back at this last year, what do you see? You know, for me, it's really interesting sitting up here this morning playing guitar and being able to look out, knowing that I was going to ask this question and, and being able to, to see the faces, uh, uh, everybody's faces this morning. And knowing that for some of you guys, there's been incredible struggles and trials and tribulations over this past year. And for some of you guys, you've had just an incredible year with you know, success and joy and peace in the Lord. And some of you guys have had this huge mix of both of these things together, uh, as odd as that is. It, um, I, I'm not one to get super emotional. Those of you guys who know me know that. <laughs> I'm a pretty steady kind of guy. Uh, but this morning, I, I singing this last song, thinking about this. I'm getting emotional looking at you guys, knowing everything that's happened in the last year. It's been a great year. It's been a hard year. And it's been everything in between. But God is good. And that's the thing that we have to come back to. Success or failure, God is good. It's good that we don't live in yesterday. But it is important that from time to time that we look back. When you're driving a car, how often do you look in the rearview mirror? You don't drive by looking in the rearview mirror, but every once in a while you have to glance in that rearview mirror and just kind of check out what's happening behind you. Make sure nobody's coming up too fast or um, you know, double check that you didn't run that red light that you are wondering if you ran or not, or you can't remember. Anybody else do that? Sometimes you drive through a light and then you're like, wow, I hope that light was green because I really don't remember it. Um, maybe it's just me. So stay off the road when I'm driving, all right? <laughs> But it's important to occasionally check that rear view mirror. You don't, you don't drive, you don't uh, keep going forward by, by studying the rear view mirror. I mean, you can do that for a little ways, but you're not going to get very far. You're going to run into something. You're going to run off the road. Uh, but it is important to look back from time to time. In verses 1 through 3 is that glance in the rear, rear view mirror. Um, just looking at the, uh, some of the vocabulary used here, um, it's all past tense in verses 1 through 3. God poured out blessings. He restored the fortunes. He forgave the guilt. He covered all their sins. He held back his fury. He held back his blazing anger. Let's pause for a moment. And let me ask this question. Was God faithful in 2017? Was God with you in 2017? Was God holy the entire year of 2017? Did God pour out blessings on you? Did God forgive you in 2017? Did God walk with you in 2017? I think the answer is yes to all of these. And in verse 4, there's a transition. There's this word. Dave, can you throw up verse 4? Now. <laughs> Something changes here in this verse. Obviously, we're going to present tense. But I think it's important where we say now. We put a stake in the ground and say, God, you are faithful then, and I know you'll be faithful today. Now, whatever happened last year happened last year, but, but today is your day. And I'm going to put a stake in the ground now to indicate that today is your day, and I'm going to stand firm on that. Verses 4 through 7 use, use again, the, the terminology uh, is present tense. Uh, but look at some of these words here. Restore us. Put aside your anger. Revive us. Show us your unfailing love. Grant us salvation. These are powerful words. And if God was faithful yesterday, he's going to be faithful today. And maybe this should be our prayer. Asking God to remind us of his unfailing love today. If God was faithful yesterday, we have no reason to doubt his faithfulness today. May this example of prayer remind us that God was living and active then but he's also living and active today. May we, we remember that God cares about you, about me today. 
that his salvation was for yesterday, but also for today and tomorrow. And a couple more thoughts. Uh, got a couple myths about yesterday. Sometimes we, uh, we live in this myth that, that yesterday controls today. That, you know, today is what it is because yesterday was so good or so bad or whatever. That, that yesterday controls today. But I'm not sure that that's the, the case exactly. Certainly, there are consequences from yesterday that catch up with us today. There's certainly, you know, if you jump out of an airplane, you're still going to hit the ground, right? <laughs> uh, that's just kind of a natural consequence. I guess God could supernaturally keep you from hitting the ground. But, uh, but as a general rule, the laws of physics um, will still apply, and you'll hit the ground. So, you know, it's just a metaphor here, okay? But, but there are consequences that will certainly catch up with us today. But yesterday does not dictate today. I'm reminded of Lamentations 3.23, where uh, speaking of God's faithfulness again, great is his faithfulness. His mercies begin afresh each morning. The second myth is this, yesterday was better than today. Who wants to go back to the good old days? You hear that all the time, right? Oh man, if we could just go back to the good old days. Now that I'm getting older, I'm saying that more and more, or I catch myself saying that. You know, like when I was a kid, we didn't even have internet. And that's the truth, but uh, that seems so strange to say now because we live on the internet. Uh, we're connected in every way all the time. You know, who would have thought you know, 20 years ago that our lives would look the way they did today because of technology? But, but sure, life was simpler yesterday. But is that what you want? Do you want the simplicity of yesterday? Let me ask this. Why is today so complicated? Who owns today? We pray this prayer, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And either the kingdom of God is retreating or the kingdom of God is advancing. And it's simply not possible for the gates of hell to gain victory over the kingdom of heaven. Though the darkness seems like it's getting thicker, the light of Christ is getting brighter every day. I think that's why it's important that we remember that yesterday was not necessarily better than today. Do we pray this prayer? Do we honestly believe that God is going to do something today? Or that, you know, maybe today is too strong for God? Is that what we're saying? I don't think today or tomorrow wins over God. I think God wins. I think the kingdom of heaven wins. I was uh, thinking too, uh, along these lines, and not to get too overly spiritual with this, but I uh, thought of my friend, some of you guys uh, knew him back in the day, um, I'll just name his name, Justin Wagner, some of you guys knew him, he's been gone for a while, and uh, so I would, you know, we would be somewhere together, or whatever, working on something together, or something, anyway, um, and be like, hey Justin, how's it going? And he would reply, <laughs> uh, I just have this vivid memory of his reply, he would simply, you know, just quote Paul, and he'd say, you know what, to live is Christ. To die is gain. No, Justin, you're not answering the question. <laughs> but it's like, but that was his response. You know, it didn't matter how things actually were. His response was always the same. To live is Christ. To die is gain. And, you know, we'd always get kind of a, a, a chuckle out of that. Um, you know, it's not too often that people respond that way. But, but for him, he really meant that. For him, it was a reminder of what today is. It doesn't matter what the circumstances are. It matters if we're with Christ and if Christ is with us. Living or dying, today is the Lord's day. There's no better place to be than with the Lord. Living or dying, today is a day that the Lord has made. I found this quote this past week uh, from Oswald Chambers. It says this, it is no use to pray for the old days. Stand square where you are and make the present better than any past has ever been. Base all on your relationship to God and go forward. And presently you will find that what is emerging is infinitely better than the past ever was. It's so going back and looking at Psalm 85, the first couple of verses here reflecting on God's faithfulness, the next few verses looking at God's faithfulness for today. What if God answers these petitions today? What changes if we pray this prayer and God responds? Blessings? 
fortunes, forgiveness of sins, that's pretty significant, restoration, salvation, unfailing love being revealed to us. I think we would all walk a little bit more upright. Our eyes would be bright and up. I think we would be beaming. I think Christ would be dripping off of us. I think truth and love would just be spilling out of us. Let's pray this prayer, and then I'll turn it over to Tony. Lord, revive us again. When yesterday has overwhelmed us, speak life in us today. Breathe on us again. Remove all the dead and dying and bring us back to life again. Show us your unfailing love and grant us your salvation. And may our lives, our changed lives, be evidence of your generosity and kindness and love. We didn't tag. We, we didn't tag. Okay. Right. You got to tag in, right? Yeah. Should okay. we set up some ropes or something here? Jump. No, because I want to be able to get 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 out quickly. Um, so Cody got two parts. I get one part. All right. So the first part, we broke that down, thinking backwards of God's graciousness and his goodness in these first three verses. The next were the petitions that he just referred to that we need to pray, restore us, revive us. You know, reviving means something was alive in the first place, right? You know, you can't revive something that was never alive, right? If it's a rock, you can't revive it. Something that was already alive can be revived. And so that call to God to say, bring us back, bring us back around. So now we have this, this uh, prayer of the patriot for the afflicted country and, and when we look around, we're afflicted. It doesn't mean we're losing. It means we're afflicted, but we need that reviving of God. So all that he read there in those first few verses. So I'm going to pick up at verse 8. I'm going to pick up at verse 8 and just, just unpack just a little bit here. God's, see, this is verse 8 is God's answer through the high priest. That's what this is. So you got looking back. you got, okay, here's where we are. And now let's ask God. Let's not do it on our own. Let's ask God. And now we've got verses 8 through 13 that say this is the answer that God wants to bring. And he brings it through his high priest. So if you read this with me, uh, I'm going to, do I have New American Standard? Is that what I have? That's where our styles are different. New King James or NASB? Let's do NASB. Uh, I, I like the New King James. I like the New Living Translation. And if you can read whatever translation you want, but listen for what God has to say to you. And so... The prayer's prayed. Grant us your salvation is the final words of the prayer. And now there's the answer. Verse 8. I will hear what God the Lord will say, for he will speak peace to his people, to his godly ones, but let them not turn back to folly. That's the first part God speaks there. See, when we believe God hears us, then the next, really the next logical thing would be is that we would be eager if he, he you know, if he we believe that God hears us, that we believe that uh, we want to hear from him, that we want to hear from him, that we're eager to hear him. I mean, he's the only one that can speak, and he can speak peace. He can speak wholeness. We talked about it last week, the Prince of Peace. He brings wholeness. How many of you have had some shattered stuff this year? You can raise your hand or not. Things have been shattered. Maybe your heart's been broken. Maybe your dreams have been shattered. And that, that word peace, shalom, one of the things, it speaks of a wholeness, of a stone that's unbroken. And so God takes and speaks peace to us when we want to hear what he has to say. The problem is, do I want to hear what he has to say? Because the response here is, I, I will hear what the Lord says. He wants to speak wholeness to us. Sometimes we've become so identified with our brokenness that it's easier just to stay in the familiar. Do I really want to hear what God has to say? And it says he'll speak that to his godly ones. In some translations, it says his saints, those he's made righteous by his own blood. And, and, and then, but let them not turn back to folly. It's God's heart that we not turn back to stuff that has brought the brokenness in the first place. I, I know it's going to happen. I mean, we can always say I'm not perfect. We, we don't live in a perfect world. That's true. 
But it's God's heart to pour out grace on us, not just to cover up what has happened in the past, but to power us up for where we're headed in the future. So he's speaking to us. The first question is, do we want to petition him and ask for these things? Restore us. Revive us. Take back your anger. Sometimes we're not even aware that he's a holy God. We'll talk about that in just a minute. So let me just move on from there. He speaks. He's the one who speaks, and it's done. Remember, this is the same God spoke, and things happened. Let there be light, and there was light. This is the God we're talking about, just to be sure. And that's why there was this reminder early on in this. So, and not returning to the folly of sin. When we really desire the unbroken communion with Christ that he purchased, that he made a covenant with his own blood, that we must be jealous for ourselves and by his grace, really, uh, desire and let him grow that desire that we not grieve the Holy Spirit. That he is a jealous God. And, and when we hear that word jealous, we think of things that, that it's kind of hard for us because we think jealous is a petty thing. But, but here's a word from Deuteronomy, from a holy God. Oh, by the way, anybody remember that the same God that we're talking about in the New Testament is the same God in the Old Testament? It is. He is. Not it. He is. And he says then, and he says now, but now we have grace. We're under grace, right? So this should be better. He's with us and in us. So watch yourselves that you do not forget the covenant of the Lord your God, which he made with you. He made with you. That's good news. And, and make for yourselves a... <laughs> don't do this. Don't make for yourselves a graven image in the form of anything against which the Lord your God has commanded you. If you're setting up things, that's when we go back to foolishness. We set up things and we think, this, this will make God happy. This will work. I can make this work for a little while. It'll look good on the outside. Don't be fooled. That's foolishness. And then he says, for the Lord your God is a consuming fire. That's a good thing. That scares us a little bit. He's a consuming fire, a jealous God. It's a love that's fiery. It's the love that kicks down the doors and flattens out the mountains and all those things we were singing a minute ago. But he's a je- he loves us so much. It's not petty jealousy. This is a fiery, consuming thing that he wants to bring a purity to our hearts with. So he wants to speak peace. to The next verse, verse 9. Surely his salvation is near those who fear him that glory may dwell in our land. Those who fear, see, faith knows that a saving God is always near. I mean, our faith says, I know he's near. It, 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 but it says here, he, salvation, Jesus himself is near to those who fear him. Let me ask you a question. Do you think the King of kings and the Lord of lords comes into a place where he's not given due honor and respect? I think we fooled ourselves into thinking that. He'll just kind of do whatever. You know, he's my buddy. He's still king of kings and lord of lords, and he does love you, by the way. He is a good, good father, but it doesn't change. We're going to see this in these verses in just a minute, too. This is the God of the universe who speaks, and it happens, and we want that to happen for us, but do we revere him? Do we give him that place of respect in our hearts? Or if we treated him like a buddy for so long, well, you know, we'll just go on down the road. You won't mind that I ran that red light. That's what we tell our friends, right? Cody tells his friends. That's just a red light, no big deal. Or like when I was driving the van this morning with Sean, he'd let me drive it back. He kind of went around a corner a little bit, you know. It's like, and the girls in the back went, hey, that's pretty cool. Uh, but it's, it's safe, Nick. It's all good. It's all good. Tone it down. <laughs> give honor, give respect. Not just to the road, not just to the ice, but to the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Let's give him that place of honor in our lives because he's near. And why do we do that? Because we want his glory. We want the weightiness of his glory. We read those passages in the Old Testament. It says, then this glory fell and the priest couldn't even stand in the house to minister. If you want that, then treat him with respect. Because glory comes when we treat God like he's God. Not just some lifeguard. Hey, can you come help me for a minute? Salvation is near to those who fear him. Respect, honor, and then his glory comes. The question this morning in our petitions is, do we really want his glory? 
Do we want to walk in that? Or we just want copacetic, I get along, go along to get along? Or do we want to see change in the next year? Do you want to see victory in this next year? It's all right here in these passages. Just a, another place in, in Psalms, real quick, and then I'll go on to verse 10. Okay, hey, i got to hurry. Ver, Psalm 89, you don't have it. Don't worry about it. 89, 6, and 7, make a note. It says, for who in the heavens can be compared to the Lord? Remember, he's high above. Who among the sons of the mighty can be likened to the Lord? Nobody in the heavenly host. God is greatly to be feared in the assembly of the saints among us. He's to be respected and honored and to be held in reverence by all those around him. So the question is, do you want to hang around him or not? Do you want him to hang around with you or not? Then we need to treat him with respect and honor. Salvation is near. He comes to those who call out for him. But, oh, let us be people that desire his glory. Okay, I've spent enough time there. Verse 10. Loving kindness or mercy, depending on the translation you have. Uh, that's why I was reading the New King James a little bit ago. It says, mercy and truth have met together. I, 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 my, my own translation says, mercy and truth have embraced. It's that idea that Jesus came full of grace and truth. Not one or the other. This is good news, friends. This is Old Testament. Speaking ahead. I mean, this is the character of God. Mercy and truth have met together. That's good news for us. The Lord who's severe in his justice. How many of you ever sinned and you've had to deal with the consequences of your sin? Everybody in the room's hand should go up right now. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Maybe been really nice and religious, but truthfully, we have dishonored God at points in our life, and sometimes very blatantly. Here's the good news. Just as he is just and he's righteous. How many of you like social justice? That's the new, that's the new term among people. Social justice. We want things to be right. Do you? We also need to be merciful in that rightness, and God has that perfectly. It says mercy and truth have embraced met together come together that's good news for us so even if there's been a severe justice that's come or a consequence to sin that's come but in his pity he sends peace to bind up those broken pieces like i talked about earlier that wound to restore wholeness to us that's the good news he is the prince of peace and he's willing and he <laughs> and he wants to make us willing the good news is by grace he wants to make us willing to forsake our sins to leave them behind not to stay comfortable with our sin but he wants to make us willing to forsake that's a word you don't hear very often i'm going to forsake that that means i'm going after something else that's a jealous love he's jealous for us and he wants us to be that way for him to love him above all other things to forsake and to follow after righteousness, and to find peace, and see his glory fall, and then truth, the, the rest of that there, righteousness and peace have kissed each other. What's the word kissed? Anybody remember from a few months ago? What's that, another word? What's the word that we use for kissed? Turn toward the kiss, proskaneo. You aren't here. Worship. Worship. It's the picture of worship. And, and God, in his, he's confederated. He's not disjointed. And he comes together and he says, righteousness and peace have kissed each other. That's good news for us. He is holy and he is righteous, but he's the one who brings peace. He is not conflicted. He's confederated. He's come together. This is good news for us. So when we pray, when we ask for, like what this patriot asked for here in 85, in these earlier verses that Cody looked at, and so, what happens? What happens when we really believe this about our God? Verse 11 says, Truth shall spring from the earth. Or how's it? Truth springs from the earth, and righteousness looks down from heaven. All of a sudden, the truth, Jesus, the way, the truth, and life, all of a sudden just begins to spring up in our hearts as we revere him, as we give him that place of honor and dignity and invite him in and glory begins to come and then truth springs from the earth 
we begin to be people of truth. The truth, not a lie. We were people of the lie. But because of his salvation, because of the blood of Jesus, we become people of truth. Promises which lie unfulfilled like buried seeds shall spring up and yield heavens. I mean, really, just a harvest of heavenly joy. Men and women renewed by grace will learn to be true to one another and to their God. We'll walk in the truth and the faithfulness and we'll begin to detest falsehood. Oh, that I would detest falsehood in any form. And only God can give that to me. Anything else is a self-righteous sort of a thing. Oh, that God would give us. Truth would spring from God. And righteousness, it says, it goes on, looks down from heaven. As if the windows of heaven were thrown open and righteousness leans out the window to grace those that are turning from sin, the penitent people whom it could not have looked upon before <laughs> without indignation. That's why we needed Jesus to come and fulfill and to cover and to satisfy the wrath of God. That's in a whole other area. Some people now, we've, we've become so enlightened, we don't believe there is the wrath of God anymore. Jesus came to take the wrath of God on our behalf. Truth springs up. Righteousness pours down. Maybe there's things you've been praying for. Maybe you've been praying the word of God, the truth. Stay faithful. Call on his grace. Seeds will spring up. I believe that. I believe that. When God looks down in grace, men and women send their hearts upward in obedience. That's the plan of God. And then, to finish it out, indeed, the Lord will give what is good. The Lord will give what is good. Being himself pure goodness. Now think about this. He will give what is good, and our land will yield its produce, or it'll produce fruit. How many of you want to produce fruit in the coming year? Anybody want that? What is that? Love, joy, if you know them, you can say them with me. Love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, kindness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. Against these things there is no law, the Word of God says. So, way before that was written in the New Testament, indeed the Lord will give what is good. Don't doubt it. Maybe you've seen things or you've experienced things. And listen, and if we're honest with ourselves, most of the stuff that we've Many times what we've experienced is because of the results of our own sin or poor choices. Sin. Poor choices makes it sound like we didn't have a choice. Sometimes in a broken world we suffer things as well. But God longs. He longs. Indeed, the Lord will give what is good. Even in our circumstances when we've not done anything against the word of God at all, against his sovereignty and we're experiencing things in a broken world he's bringing good he works all things together for good for those who love him and called according to his purpose isn't that right is that what the word of God says it's true it's true and we will produce fruit seeds remember that idea seeds will spring up that truth will spring up righteousness looks down that's what happens when we pray and petition God to do what he really wants to do. And the land will increase. The curse of barrenness will f fly with the curse of sin. The curse of barrenness will fly with the curse of sin when we trust God, when we ask him, when we ask for forgiveness, when we pray and ask him to cleanse and heal and make new and bring his peace. And then the last verse there 13 righteousness will go before him he is righteous righteousness goes before him and will make his footsteps into a way the righteousness of God goes before him and makes his footsteps into a way we're to follow in the steps of Jesus aren't we are, are anybody disciple in the room of Jesus you want to follow him you've committed your life to him and by his grace, we're following him. And so the way of Jesus is the way I want to go in 2018. I, I have no other major plans. I know where I'm going. I hope you know where you're going. 
There's one destination, friends. You, you may have all other kinds of plans, and that's fine, but the first destination is I'm going to Jesus, for he alone has the words of life. I'm going to Jesus because he alone has grace and truth, both at the same time. He is grace and truth. And so I can trust him that he is holy and he is powerful, but he's also merciful and kind and quick to forgive. This is our God. And so I don't know where you've been. And John Bevere says, where we have been and where we are is not where we are headed. Where we have been and where we are is not where we are headed. We must raise our eyes to the horizon and look for his coming glory. We just celebrated the advent, the first coming of Jesus, which also reminds us that he's coming again for his people, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, loving him back in worship. And that's not just in song, that's every day. Here I am, I offer myself as a living sacrifice to you, O oh God. See, the simplicity of that almost escapes us. And we want to make it more. But the reality is this. He loves me. I love him. I win. That applies to you. He already loves you. He loves me. I love him because he's enabled that through the blood of Christ. I can come to him. He's made a covenant that now I get to participate in. Participate. That's what we'll talk about in days ahead. And we win. Regardless of circumstance at the very moment, we win. It, regardless of the hardship, we win. Because his desire in us coming to him is that we look more like Christ. Uh, did Jesus have it perfectly easy uh, when he was on the planet? God in flesh? Everything just went his way, right? No. But he was secure in who he belonged to. The Father sent him. And he knew he was loved to the Father. When we have that basis of the very, that truth, he loves me. I love him. I win. I look more like Jesus. And you can too. As we offer ourselves to this God who loves us greatly, who has laid his life down to show us exactly who the Father is. He's restored captivity before. He wants to speak peace to our hearts. Surely his salvation is near to those who reverence him, who give him a place, who honor him. Come on in, Jesus. Come and sit on the throne. Oh, here, I'm giving you the best seat in the house right here. The seat of my affections. Will I honor him that way? He wants to speak peace to his godliness. His salvation is near those who fear him. Loving kindness and truth. They've already met. They've been in existence since before time. Righteousness and peace have kissed. Truth springs from the earth. Whatever you've been praying in the word of truth, it wants to spring forth. He wants to bring it about in his timing. And righteousness looks down from heaven. And indeed, the Lord will give what is good. And our land will yield produce. The land that's been purchased by the blood of Christ. And righteousness will go before him. Righteousness will go before him and make his steps in the way. A little poem. Freed from the curse. Uh, worship team, are you around? Come on back up here. Freed from the curse, the grateful garden gives its fruit in goodly revenue. Nor frost, nor blight, nor mildew fall, nor canker worm, nor caterpillar. We're not familiar with it. We're not farmers, if you're not familiar with it. Mar one ripening hope. The clouds drop fatness, richness, goodness, and the very elements are subject to the prayerful will of those whose pleasure is in unison, whose pleasure is in unison with God. How do I know the will of God? Seek Him. Know Him. His Word is true. His Spirit illuminates those who are following, who've become part of the family, sons and daughters of the living God because of the work of Christ Jesus the good news, Jesus came, lived among us, tempted in every way just like us, yet without sin, went to the cross, not because he was guilty, but because he paid the price and satisfied the wrath of the Father, the wrath of God on our behalf, and he extends it to us. 
died on that cross, rose again in power on the third day, and even now sits at the right hand of the Father interceding for us. That gives me hope for a new year. There's stuff in front of me that looks challenging. Anybody have challenging stuff in front of you? Okay. Here's the good news. Our first stop, our only stop, the only place we keep going, our destination is Jesus. He is our habitation. He is our destination, and he wants to speak peace to our hearts. When we will walk in that, fruit is going to be produced. Christ-likeness is the fruit. It's not being regarded in some manner among men. It's not having all the goodies that I ever wanted in life. It's possessing what God already possesses. The character and nature of Christ available to us by the Holy Spirit. I want you to stand with me. Let me just pray over you. And, and maybe for you this morning, it might be weird, maybe it's not. Would you just, maybe just turn your palms upward to the Lord? Maybe it's just in gratefulness for this last year. 2017 was, was great, and you see it, and you know it, and you're just giving thanks. But maybe the upward palms are just to receive the grace, the empowerment, the truth, and the mercy of Christ for the coming year, for what he has for you. Thank you, Lord, that you make all things new. Thank you that you've allowed into our lives this past year the good along with the hard stuff, which have reminded us of how much we really need you, O oh God, and to rely on your presence filling us every single day. Lord, we pray for your spirit to lead us in each step of this new year. We ask that you would guide our decisions, turn our hearts to deeply desire, to hunger and thirst for you above all else. Lord, we ask that you'll open doors that will need to be opened and close ones needing to be shut tight, that we won't return to any folly. Oh God, we ask that you would help us to just release our grip on things which you've said no, not yet, or wait. We ask for help to pursue you first that you are our destination. Lord, that you're our habitation. We want to live in Christ. We ask for your wisdom, for your strength, your power to be constantly present with us. And we pray that you would make us strong and courageous for the road ahead. Give us ability beyond what we feel able to. What would bring you glory? Let your glory fall. Pray that you'd keep us far from the snares and the traps of temptations. Lord, that you would whisper in our ear when we need to run from something. And Lord, you'd shout at our heart when we need to stand our ground because that's where you have us and we're doing it in truth and righteousness. Lord, may we always be merciful. Lord, protect our friends and our families. Lead us and guide us to you and you alone. And Lord, in the fear of God, a holy fear, may we offer afresh the throne of our hearts, the seat of our affections, that you would be sitting there, ruling and reigning. Let your kingdom rule and reign come to my heart, O oh God, to our hearts, O oh God. Lord, that we would bring the agents of change. We'd be ambassadors of this rule and reign, your kingdom. Let your kingdom come, O oh God. Let your will be done. Lord, as we give you that place of king and Lord, then your will will be done. We'll desire we'll follow, we'll obey from the heart. So Lord, come. Come Lord Jesus. Come Holy Spirit. Lord, help us to be honest before you right now and offer our hearts as the throne room. Be the king of our hearts, we pray today. I ask this now in your precious name, Jesus, for your glory. Let's just sing this together. Make this a prayer unto the Lord. Take a position before him and with all you know of who you are, let the king of your heart. Let the king of my heart be the mountain where I run, the fountain I drink from. Oh, he is my song. And let the king of my heart be the shadow where I hide, the ransom for my life. Oh, he is
showed favor before he will show it again he's forgiven iniquity and he will forgive even now he's covered all of our sin by his very blood not because of our sacrifices because he is the sacrifice we worship him because of his great mercy not so that we get something we go to him so that we We'll see him in all of his glory. We'll adore him. We'll love him and worship him. And what we behold, we become like. It can happen conversely. What we behold, we become like. What will we put in front of us? What will sit? Who will sit on the throne of our heart in 2018 as individuals and as a people? There are mighty things that God wants to do. Rend the heavens and come down in incredible ways. Will we be vessels available, willing, desirous, jealous for him, not for all the other stuff that we've gone after in the past? Jesus makes it clear that to follow him, we must first count the cost. And let me just tell you the news right here today. The price is nothing short of our lives. Nothing short of our lives. That may seem too hard, but he's worthy. He's holy. We sing the songs, do we believe it? That his glory would be seen in the earth today. That the good news would be known, not only proclaimed, but lived. And now may the God of peace, 
the one who brought up the great shepherd from the dead. May him, by his very blood, may he lead you and guide you and equip you for every good work for his purpose and for his glory. And those who want that just might say amen. 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 Lord bless you. Uh, Happy New Year. Uh, those for the bold and, and, and the beautiful, we'll see you tonight at 7 o'clock. Uh, we're going to bring in, pray in, praise in the New Year.